The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Bloody Wild. Here on YouTube, no one will shut up about this game at the moment. It is the only thing people seem to be talking about. To be fair, even my private Facebook feed is chock to the brim full of people rimming this game. However, today's video isn't about how good Breath of the Wild is, because every bastard on YouTube is collectively doing videos like that at the moment. Today, I am almost going to be reviewing reviews. Well, at least be giving my opinion on other people's opinions. Today's video will be looking at 10 ridiculous Zelda review scores by IGN. Now, now, I know all game reviews are based on personal opinion rather than anything factual, and that everyone's taste is bloody different. I am a strong believer in everyone being entitled to an opinion, but at the same time, I also believe that all opinions are open to ridicule, and of course to be called bloody stupid. So it's time to give some IGN Zelda scores a good old critique, and some Sometimes, a jolly good verbal freshen. Let's start with what is current, and talk about the article that gave me the idea for this video in the first place. Breath of the Wild. IGN have given this new game a perfect 10 out of 10 score, which by any grading system standards, it's absolutely ludicrous. How can any sane person view a video game as absolutely flawless? No game is bloody perfect, that is impossible. How on earth can you attach an immaculate score like 10 out of 10 to any game? That's completely nonsensical. We live in the real world rather than a fantasy, so perfection doesn't really exist anyway. It is a human construct that cannot physically be reached by a game. So who knows what crack the author was smoking when the review score was given for this one. Anyway, speaking of Breath of the Wild, I have only played the game for three hours thus far, so I cannot give an in-depth analysis at this point. But I will say there were times over that three hour period where I stopped for toilet breaks, stopped to check my phone, and stopped to look at social media, etc. My point being that if I could get so easily distracted by simple things like that, I clearly wasn't that immersed in the game for it to be this immaculately conceived game IGN claim it to be. But, by what everyone is telling me though, Breath of the Wild sounds like a great game. I am a strong believer that nothing is perfect in this life, so I shan't be believing IGN regarding this one for even a second. Now I have played through every other Zelda game from start to finish, so I know about the rest of the entire series in detail. So let's look at some of their other Zelda reviews. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for the Nintendo Wii. Let's see what score IGN gave this. What? You have to be bloody kidding me! Another 10 out of 10? So you are telling me now that both these Zelda games are absolutely immaculate and perfect? What kind of bullcrap is this? Was the person who wrote this article half asleep or something at the time when they was playing and reviewing this one? Because from playing through this game myself, the game seems to be extremely flawed and packed the brim with motion controls in which didn't function properly. So let's take a look at some of the quotes in this review for this so-called perfect 10 out of 10 game. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword will be remembered for revitalising a franchise that had for some time seemingly settled for being merely great instead of revolutionary. Once again Nintendo is demonstrating its unparalleled ability to craft some of the greatest gameplay this industry has ever seen. Right, okay, so implementing broken motion controls into a Zelda game did all that? Well, fair enough, I suppose the writer is entitled to their opinions, but personally, I felt that this was annoying rather than revolutionary. After all, this was bloody late 2011, motion controls were so 2006. Anyway, let's see what other profound stuff the writer had to say. No game is perfect, and Skyward Sword suffers from a few small issues. Every now and then the camera isn't quite in the position it ought to be, the Wii Remote will require calibration here and there, and somehow seems to know when doing so will be most inconvenient. The frame rate will dip now and then, and of course the game is constrained by the Wii's processing power as well. 
These are all very fair points and address some of the many flaws in which Skyward Sword has. However, if the reviewer could clearly see all these flaws, then why in the bloody hell did they score the game a perfect 10 out of 10 and refer to it as a masterpiece? This again doesn't make any logical sense. Who writes this bloody crap and okays the publication of it? Ridiculous isn't even the bloody word. Let's hit two birds with one stone now, Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. Now these weren't the best ever 2D Zelda games, but both were decent efforts in my opinion. Both fun games, but I didn't feel they reached the dizzy heights of Link to the Past or Link's Awakening. Let's see what IGN thought of these. What? Bloody 10 out of 10 for both of these games too? This is becoming a recurring theme now. Do they just automatically grade every Zelda game ever 10 out of 10 or something just so they don't upset Nintendo fanboys? Let's quickly take a look at how they graded some of the other classics in the series to see if this is the case. The original Zelda was given a 9 out of 10, Link to the Past a 9.5 out of 10 and Link's Awakening a 9.5 out of 10. So those three classics all have been given pretty fair scores. All amazing games but not graded as flawless since flawlessness is an impossibility. Ok so that part makes logical sense. But claiming that the Skyward Sword and the Oracle games are better than those three all-time classics is absolutely ludicrous. From a personal perspective, I felt that the Oracle games retreaded too much of the same ground from Link's Awakening to be considered as innovative as its prequel. To be fair to the reviewer though regarding his Perfect 10, at least the feedback he gave the game is 100% positive. So at the least the score is in line with the review, making the write-up less ludicrous than the Skyward Sword one. But in the same vein, isn't a reviewer another word for critic? And isn't it his job to critique and criticise things? Well with that IGN, I'm going to criticise you. You blithering morons are either mindless bloody fanboys, or you must be scared of losing your review copies from Nintendo or something. Giving zero criticism or something is a coward's way of writing a review. Shame. 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 Next up we have Minish Cap. This was the next Zelda entry in the handheld library. Obviously the graphics in this game were a massive step up from the Oracle games, as this game featured on the Game Boy Advance rather than the colour. Apart from that though, for a Zelda game, I found it to be a rather lacklustre affair. The game felt short and it didn't feel like it had the same depth as the other games in the series. But let's see what IGN thought. Ah, uh, still 9 out of 10. IGN seem to bloody love this one too, although this quote seems to be fairly on the negative side for a game scored so highly. The slight repetitive nature of the Kinstones, the slightly shorter quest and the lack of 4 player 4 swords mode does put this new adventure slightly under the previous GBA effort. I guess by previous entry they mean the bloody re-release of Link's The Past, one of the best Zelda games of all time. So tell me please IGN, do you genuinely believe that adding the Four Swords mode to Minish Cap would have put this game in the same league as Link's The Past? Because that sounds like absolute tripe to me, but everyone has an opinion I suppose, no matter how stupid it may be. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of stupid, looking at the 9.0 score IGN gave the game, they actually rate the quality of their games on five criteria: Presentation, graphics, sound, gameplay and lasting appeal. Doing a simple calculation to find the average of these five scores actually calculates as 8.8 .8 rather than bloody 9.0. So it looks like the people at IGN do not even know how to bloody do maths either. Now let's look at my least personal favourite Zelda game of all time, the Phantom Bloody Hourglass for the DS. This game controls for some reason using a bloody DS stylus of all things, rather than a simple effective D-pad or analog stick. I guess sometimes Miyamoto just loves to get his gimmicks in under the guise of innovation. It's all very pretentious if you ask me. Apart from the odd control methods, the game is also extremely repetitive. The Phantom Hourglass forces you to go through the exact same dungeon over and over again. The whole thing is bloody annoying if you ask me, but that's enough about asking me, let's ask bloody IGN instead! Let's look at a couple of key quotes from the review. Nintendo went for a more casual approach this time around, keeping the amount of hardcore dungeon crawling to a minimum and shedding the traditional control scheme for a more casual friendly approach. But with that being said, Phantom Hourglass is still an extremely ambitious, entertaining and innovative product. 
great games are made up of a series of truly captivating moments. A Link to the Past had the unveiling of the Master Sword. Ocarina of Time hooked gamers with the simplicity and entertainment of riding the Hyrule countryside with Epona for the very first time. And Twilight Princess astonished loyal Zelda fans as they witnessed their hero change forms in the midst of the twilight. The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass has those moments too, and while it may be more casual than we'd like, it's captivating, entertaining, and a true adventure worthy of the Zelda name. Reading these parts of the review make this game sound like an epic and worthy of its 9 out of 10 grade. Which again, to go along with the theme of this video, I think it's ridiculous. Especially when you read this quote from the same bloody review. Everything is assigned to touch. Attacking, rolling and running is all left to the DS's interpretation. And while it works for the definite majority of the time, it isn't nearly as precise as the D-pad controls. Link will sometimes roll seemingly on his own, something that becomes an issue when working near the edge of a cliff. He'll swipe his sword when the player attempts to turn too fast, though as you get used to the controls, this is more of a random occurrence. And at times, players looking to execute a dodging roll may find that it's not always as receptive as you'd like. We don't want to paint a picture that Zelda is a broken game, as that is most certainly not the case, but we will take some getting used to after 20 years of D-pad control. We don't want to paint a picture of this being a broken Zelda game. Hmm, that sounds to me IGN that for some reason the reviewer here isn't being completely forthright with his opinion. He has painted the perfect picture of the controls being a major problem. So in this vein, why is he still giving the game a bloody 9 out of 10? Poor controls are a deal breaker for me and it's the very reason I will eternally loathe the Phantom Hour class. Next, we will look at Spirit Tracks, my second least favourite Zelda game. Basically, it's just a clone of the Phantom Hourglass. All the bad controls are back, but at least this time it doesn't force you to go through the same dungeon over and over again. At least the premise is good too. It's like a Legend of Zelda and Thomas the Tank Engine crossover. What isn't to love about that idea? IGN scored this game a 9.3 which is still ludicrously high considering the quality of this game, but at least it's in line with the Phantom Hourglass review, as in it's a few points better than the original. But speaking of the ridiculously high 9.3 score, to put this in perspective for you, they only gave Final Fantasy XV an 8.2 and Pokemon Sun and Moon a 9.0. The people who work here must have this proper mad Zelda fetish to rank something subpar like Spirit Tracks above those other games. From what I have read from IGN's review on this one, I must say I do agree with most of their comparisons with Phantom Hourglass. For example, they had this to say. While Spirit Tracks has some obvious deja vu elements and can drag from time to time, Nintendo's latest Pocket Zelda trumps the first game hands down. So to summarise, there isn't really anything profound to say about this review besides a ridiculously high review score. But then again, that appears to be the recurring theme of this video. So, to close this video, let's hear from you, the viewers. Do you think these review scores for any of these games are reflections of the game's quality? Or do you agree with me and think reviewers are talking complete tripe? Let me know in the comment section, it will be really interesting to hear your thoughts. Anyway, if I have learned anything from today, it's that IGN writers seem to really bloody love Zelda games, and do not even seem to want to criticise the lacklustre entries in the series. I wonder if this is truly the writer's opinions. It's at least an interesting talking point. Thank you for watching today's video. Shoutouts to Jarrett Tolzian, Mad Ape Productions, Andreas Larson, Peter Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly, and all of my other patrons. Thank you for all of your support. Yeah! If you want to be added to this prestigious list, then check out my Patreon page. And for now, select one of the annotations and watch one of my other videos. Ta-ta and farewell.